This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. In our previous lesson, we discussed the basics of baptism. And friends, in truth, baptism is one of the simplest subjects in all of the Bible. The command itself is very easy to understand. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. You know, a person certainly doesn't need an advanced degree to understand that. And the purpose of baptism is explained in equally simple terms. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, Baptism does now also save us. And lest anyone be confused about it, the Lord illustrates baptism for us in word pictures. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 38, And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Friends, the truth of the matter is, baptism is not a complicated or confusing subject. Now, somebody might ask, why then are so many people confused about it? Why do religious people so vehemently argue the point? And friends, the answer is the devil. The devil is working hard to make sure that people are confused about this point. Because think about it. Baptism is the door to the church. Baptism is the point at which a person contacts the cleansing blood of Jesus. Baptism is, is that final act of obedience that moves a man from the category of the lost to the category of the saved. Of course the devil doesn't want people to understand this. Friends, a person does not study the Bible without some sort of outside inter interference and conclude that baptism is not necessary. A person does not read, he who believes and is baptized will be saved and conclude, oh, I see that baptism is not necessary. That's not the way it works. What I want to do in this lesson is to look at some of the most common arguments that are made in an effort to refute baptism. And I want us to answer these very simply from the Bible. We're going to cover eight arguments. All right, argument number one is what I call the ACE argument. Now this is not A-C-E, but the transliterated form is E-I-S. The Greek form is Epsilon, Iota, Sigma, because of course the New Testament was originally written in Greek. Now, this argument comes from Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, where the Bible says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Now, very clearly this passage teaches that baptism is for the remission of sins. Now, sin causes a man to be lost, Romans 6.23, and this verse teaches to have your sins remitted or removed you must be baptized. Friends, it is a powerful verse to show the necessity of baptism. Well, if you're a person who doesn't believe in the necessity of baptism, what are you going to do with this verse? Well, I'll tell you what some people do. Do you see the word for in Acts 2.38? It is the Greek word ace. They will tell you that ace doesn't really mean for. They will say that is a mistranslation. They will say that ace really means because of, repent and be baptized because of the remission of your sins. And so they'll say that baptism is something you do because your sins have already been forgiven. Now, how do you answer this argument? Let me give you several answers to it. Number one, I want to suggest to you Thayer's Greek lexicon answers this argument. If you will look up the Greek word ace in Thayer's, you will find that this word means into unto, to, towards, for, or among. Now that's there's Greek lexicon, which is considered to be authoritative. It does not even offer because of as a possible definition for this word. And I think it's worth noting that Thayer's is respected across the spectrum of Christendom. You can buy it in any religious bookstore. So number one, I'd go to Thayer's. Number two, I would point out that if ace in this verse did mean that baptism is because of the remission of sins, then it would also mean that repentance is because of the remission of sins. Because don't forget, these two words, repent and baptized, are joined by the conjunction and, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. 
But friends, I've never met anybody who believes that we should repent because our sins have already been forgiven. They all acknowledge that repentance must come first. Number three, in answering this argument, I would point out that the Greek word ace appears more than 2,000 times in the New Testament and it is never translated as because of. In fact, let me show you another passage that has almost the exact same wording for the remission of sins. In Matthew 26, 28, the Bible says that Jesus shed His blood, quote, for the remission of sins. The Baptist scholar A.T. Robertson had no problem understanding the word ace in this passage. He clearly says that Jesus meant that His blood was for, in order to achieve, the remission of sins. He says, however, when you come to Acts 2.38, he says this. He says, this phrase is the subject of endless controversy. One will decide the use here according as he believes that baptism is essential to the remission of sins or not. And so, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, rather than relying on the grammar, he says, well, the word, what it means here, it depends on your theology. He says your theology determines this, not the grammar which was inspired by God. Now friends, that is not honest. All right, let's look at a second argument that sometimes people try to make to refute the necessity of baptism. I call this one the Mark 16.16 argument. Now, I believe that Mark 16.16 is one of the most powerful verses in the entire Bible to teach the necessity of baptism. Mainly, I think that because of its simplicity. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Friends, it just doesn't get any simpler than that. A man must believe and be baptized before he can be saved. English grammar demands it. Greek grammar demands it. Now, I don't want to get into a, a deep study of Greek grammar, but very briefly, I want to share with you some Greek grammar rules. And if you understand these rules, then this question about baptism in Mark 16, 16 will forever be laid to rest. In this verse, the word believe and the word baptized are aorist participles. The word and is a coordinating conjunction that binds these two together. The leading verb in the sentence is will be saved. Now, basic Greek grammar states that aorist participles action occurs before the main verb and in rare cases its action can occur at the same time as the main verb. Now, since believe and baptized are joined by a coordinating conjunction, and they are aorist participles, they must take place before the leading verb, which is will be saved. Now, you say, well, that sounds confusing. In very simple English, grammatically speaking, what it is saying is this. Saved can't happen until believe and baptized have taken place. In other words, you can't be saved first and baptized later. Friends, this is as solid an argument that has ever existed. And Greek experts testify to its validity to include Macon, Summers, and Robertson. And again, A.T. Robertson doesn't even believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, but he still attests to the fact that the Greek grammar here demands such. Now, somebody says, well, what could a person possibly do to deny this passage? Well, here's one thing that people do. Read the verse with me. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now here's the argument that they make. They will say the second part of this verse shows that baptism is not necessary because it only says that if a person does not believe, he will be condemned. It doesn't say that if he doesn't believe and is not baptized, that he'll be condemned. Friends, I'm not trying to be insulting, but this is a very desperate argument because number one, it does not change the force of the grammar. It doesn't change what the verse says. The grammatical construction still demands baptism. In fact, let me illustrate this another way. If I were to say, if you come to my house and cut my grass, I will give you $50. But if you don't come to my house, I will not give you $50. Would anybody have any trouble understanding that? Would anyone conclude from that statement that all that's necessary to do to get $50 is to come to my house? Nobody would think that. They would understand that you have to come to my house and you have to cut the grass. Now, they might say, well, in the second part, he says if, if you don't come to the house, you don't get the money. He didn't say if you don't cut the grass, 
You see, people understand that if you don't come to the house, you can't cut the grass. The second requirement is dependent upon the first requirement. And the same thing is true in Mark 16, 16. If a person doesn't believe, he cannot be baptized. You don't even have to state the second requirement because it's dependent upon the first one. People understand this when you illustrate it in terms such as coming to the house and cutting the grass and getting paid. So why do people get confused when it comes to the subject of baptism? Friends, I believe it's because oftentimes they have a presupposed idea that baptism is not necessary because there's nothing in this verse that would lead you to believe that baptism is not required. Okay, here's a third argument I want us to consider. I'm calling this one the ancient manuscript argument. This is another argument to try to get around the force of Mark 16, 16. Now, people will argue that Mark 16, 16 does not belong in the Bible in the first place. And they will say that Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, should not be in the Bible. To prove this, they will point to some of the oldest manuscripts, and they will say that these old manuscripts do not even contain this section of Scripture. In fact, the New International Version, the NIV, has a footnote that says this, "...the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20." Well, when a person hears that, that sounds impressive until you hear the rest of the story. First, their statement that some of the most reliable manuscripts do not include this section is a very prejudiced statement. You need to understand that we do not have any of the original documents. We don't have the autographs. We don't have the book of Matthew as written by Matthew. We don't have the letters written by Paul that is in his own hand. All we have today are copies. We have between five and 6,000 Greek manuscripts. And the presumption is the older they are, the more reliable they're supposed to be because they are closer to the original date. Or again, that's the supposition. But it's not necessarily a true supposition. I want you to consider this. Maybe Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, and we know that he did. But suppose that after he wrote this book, immediately someone in Ephesus sat down and made a copy of it but let's say they made a mistake. Now, let's say that five or ten years later, someone takes that original autograph that Paul wrote, and they copied it, but they made no mistakes. Now, which one's more accurate, the older one or the more recent one? Do you see the, the problem with this argument that older is better? Now, secondly, the manuscripts that people are referring to when they say the oldest manuscripts do not contain this, they're referring to a total of two manuscripts that do not contain Mark 16, 9 through 20. They are the Codex Sinaiticus, Codex means book, and the Codex Vaticanus. These are the two Greek manuscripts that we have that are the old ones they're referring to that do not contain Mark 16, 9 through 20. But we also have ancient versions and patristic writers older than these two manuscripts who do refer to this passage of Scripture, this section of Scripture. Now, these two manuscripts are the ones that the NIV is largely based on. But what is very interesting is that the Codex Vaticanus leaves a blank space large enough for the missing verses, Mark 16, 9 through 20. Now, scholars have speculated that this would indicate that whoever was copying this knew that there was a missing section, but for some reason they did not have a copy of it, and so they left a space for it in this manuscript. Another thing that's very interesting is that if you look at the top five oldest manuscripts, the other three manuscripts, which are very close in the same age bracket as the two that we just mentioned, do include Mark 16, 9 through 20. In fact, the vast majority of manuscripts that we have do include these verses. There are just a few, the, the two we mentioned, that omit it, but hundreds include it. Now, somebody says, well, the oldest omit it, and therefore they're the most reliable, therefore we should omit it. Is that reliable thinking? You know, interestingly, these two ancient manuscripts that omit Mark 16, 9 through 20 include some fake portions of Scripture. They include apocryphal books to include Tobit, Ecclesiasticus, as well as others. And so if we're going to conclude that those two are the two that are right because they are the oldest and we should omit Mark 16, 9 through 20, 
then we should also accept the fake writings that they contain. These two manuscripts also omit John chapter 21 and verse 25. Should we also omit it? Interestingly, the NIV doesn't make a footnote about that particular passage. These two manuscripts, either one or both, are missing Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, Luke 6 and verse 1, Luke 22, 43, 23, 34, John 9, 38, John 19, 33 and 34, Ephesians 1, 1, and 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Hebrews 9, 15, and the entire book of Revelation. And so the point is, we need to base our conclusion on the majority of the evidence, not on just two manuscripts. Now, one more very important point. The manuscripts, the two manuscripts to which they are referring are the Greek manuscripts. But there are other documents that are even older. One of the oldest that we have is the old Syriac translation. It dates back to the lifetimes of early Christians who could and likely did know the Apostle John personally. And it does contain Mark 16, 9 through 20. It's also included in the Ethiopic, the Egyptian, the Old Italic, the Sahedic, and Coptic translation, all of which are older or as old as the two Greek manuscripts which omit it. Now, you say, well, all that's, that's kind of confusing that you're saying, what's the point? Friends, the point is this. The evidence is there that Mark 16, 9 through 20 should be in your Bible. It belongs in your Bible. And besides that, this same biblical principle is taught in other passages as well. Okay, here's a fourth argument that is sometimes made by people to try to refute the necessity of baptism. I'm calling this the Paul did not baptize argument. Now, this argument comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, where Paul writes, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. I want you to pay special attention to this next part. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, this argument is taken from verse 17 where Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach. And those trying to get around the force of baptism, they will argue that Paul was teaching that baptism is not a part of the plan of salvation because he said that the Lord did not send him to baptize. And they believe this is a very strong argument. Friends, first, I want you to appreciate with me that this passage cannot be teaching that baptism is not necessary or else it would be contradicting the other clear passages that we've already covered. Secondly, Paul himself taught that baptism is necessary. He taught, number one, that baptism puts a person into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Number two, baptism puts a person into Christ, Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 27. He taught that baptism is when a person is buried with Christ, Romans 6, 4, Colossians 2, 12. He taught that baptism is when a person is united with Christ, Romans 6, 5. He taught that baptism is when a person's sins are forgiven, Romans 6, 7, Colossians 2, 13. Thirdly, in the very context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul makes it clear that baptism is necessary. I want you to notice that he says two things are necessary if a person is going to belong to Paul or to Apollos or to Cephas or to Christ. Number one, he says that that person must be crucified for you. Number two, now listen to this one. Number two, he says you must be baptized in the name of that person. Now, that's very key. This very context teaches that baptism is necessary if you want to belong to Christ. Fourth, Paul said that he was not sent to baptize, and yet he had baptized people. So was he in violation of what he was supposed to be doing? Of course not. Remember, we've got to keep this in context. The context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is the fact that there was division in the church. Some people were holding to men instead of Christ. And in light of that, Paul says, I'm glad that I have not personally baptized many of you or, or else you would be uh, trying to hold to me. This would have aggravated the problem. When he said that he was not sent to baptize, he did not mean that he shouldn't do it because sometimes he did it. 
What he meant was this was not his primary work as an apostle. Any Christian can do the baptizing. That wasn't the special work of an apostle of Jesus Christ. All right, here's a fifth argument. I'm calling this one the thief on the cross argument. This is maybe the most common argument that is made against the necessity of baptism for salvation. Now the argument that people make is very simple. It says this, the thief on the cross was not baptized and yet he was saved and so therefore I do not have to be baptized in order to be saved. Now we could spend an entire lesson on this point alone and in fact we have an entire lesson specifically dealing with the thief on the cross. But for now, let's very briefly answer this argument. When somebody says, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized and he was saved, so I don't have to be baptized either, first, I would point out to that person that the thief on the cross might have been baptized. We don't know that. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 42, the thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now that tells me the thief knew something about the kingdom. That might mean that the thief had been baptized under the baptism of John the Baptist. You remember in Matthew chapter 3, John was preaching the kingdom and he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. And so since the thief knew about the kingdom, maybe he was baptized under John's baptism. Secondly, when a person says that he wants to be saved like the thief on the cross, I would point out that there are several very key things that are applicable to us today that had not yet taken place when Jesus granted the thief salvation. Number one, Christ had not yet died. Now that being the case, the New Testament that we live under today had not yet gone into effect. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 16 says, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Since Christ had not died, New Testament baptism was not yet in effect. Number two, Christ had not yet been buried. Now Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 says that we today who live under the Christian age, we are buried with Christ in baptism. Now that could not have taken place for the thief because Jesus had not yet been buried. Number three, Christ had not yet been raised from the dead. Now for those of us today in the Christian age, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, I can't be saved like the thief on the cross because I must believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. That had not taken place yet at the time that the thief died. Number four, at the time that the thief was hanging on the cross and at the time that the thief died, Christ had not yet given the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus gave the command to go into all the world teaching them and baptizing them. This is after the thief. And so baptism in the name of Christ, the baptism of the Great Commission was later. It was after the thief died. So the baptism of the Great Commission could not have been applicable to the thief. Okay, a sixth argument that sometimes people make relates to Cornelius. People will argue that Cornelius was saved prior to being baptized, therefore baptism is not necessary for salvation. Now, you may remember that in Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter is sent to the home of a man named Cornelius. Cornelius, of course, was the first Gentile convert. It's in Acts chapter 10 that God first brings the Gentiles into the church. And, and this is a very difficult thing for the Jews to accept. They just could not believe that God would accept the Gentiles. Anyway, God sends Peter to Cornelius' house to preach to them. Acts chapter 10 and verse 44 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Now, upon seeing this, Peter sees that the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They received miraculous ability. They began to speak in tongues. When Peter saw that, in verse 47 he says, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Now, the argument, and, and I think I should say assumption rather than argument, the assumption is that since the Holy Spirit fell on them prior to water baptism, that that means that they were saved prior to water baptism. But friends, the problem is this. This argument, again, is nothing but 
an assumption. There is not a single verse in the Bible that states that Holy Spirit baptism saves a person. There is not one indication in the Bible that says that being baptized by the Holy Spirit is an indication of your salvation. And as a side note, Holy Spirit baptism is only recorded twice in the Bible anyway. Once on the Jews in Acts chapter 2 and once upon the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. But secondly, there is something very key that people are missing when they make this argument about Cornelius. If you get this point that I'm about to make, you can definitively answer their argument. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 15, now remember, in Acts chapter 10, we have the account where the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and his household and they begin to speak in tongues and they've got miraculous ability. And then Peter sees that and says, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized? In Acts chapter 11, which is the next chapter, Peter is rehearsing what took place in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 15, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius' household, now listen, as Peter began to speak. Now, Acts 11, 14, the previous verse says that Peter was going to tell these people words whereby they could be saved. And so what happens is this. Peter shows up. He's going to tell them words whereby they can be saved. But as soon as he starts speaking the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Now, do you see the problem with this? He had not yet even told them what to do to be saved. He had just started his sermon. You see, the point is, a person has to hear the Word before he can be saved. They had not even heard the Word yet. He had not even told them how to be saved. And yet the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Friends, you know what this is? This is proof positive that the Holy Spirit baptism had nothing to do with them being saved. Now somebody says, then why did it happen? Why did the Holy Spirit fall upon them? And the answer is because the Jews were having a very hard time accepting the fact that God was going to allow the Gentiles to be a part of the church, that Gentiles could be saved. They could not believe that God would accept the Gentiles. And so God lets the Holy Spirit fall upon these Gentiles. They do miracles, they speak in tongues, and it clicks with the Jews, it clicks with Peter. And he says, God is obviously accepting them because they're having the same miraculous evidence that we did. And in light of that, God is obviously allowing them to be saved. And so immediately he says, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized? That is Peter saying, I get it. God is accepting them, therefore they should be baptized so that they can have their sins remitted. All right. Argument number seven. Sometimes people will make this argument. Sometimes people will say, well, baptism is merely an outward sign of an inward grace. They will say that baptism is not something that's necessary for salvation, but rather they will say baptism is just merely symbolic so that other people can see it. And they will go to a passage like Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, they will read that passage and they will say, see, the whole thing is just symbolic. It is a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And and so they'll say when we are baptized, we're just reenacting it for the world. It's an outward sign for the world of an inward grace. That is, we're already saved. Friends, the problem is that the text does not say that this is merely symbolic. Rather, what the text says is that baptism puts us into Christ verse 3, and 2 Timothy 2.10 says that salvation is in Christ, and so without baptism to put me into Christ, I have no salvation. This passage also says that we are buried into the death of Christ. Now Christ shed His blood in His death, and in baptism I contact that blood in His death. The text says, after baptism we are raised to walk in newness of life. Now, If this outward sign theory were correct, then I would have already been walking in newness of life prior to baptism. Remember, they believe that you are saved first and then you're baptized. So that would mean I have newness of life 
and then I'm baptized. That's not what the Bible says. Romans 6, 3, and 4 says that we are baptized, and at that point, after baptism, at the point of baptism, we get newness of life. Now, sometimes when discussing the figure, the supposed figure of Romans 6, 3, and 4, they will also point to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 in the King James Version of the Bible, where it says, "...the like figure whereunto baptism doth now also save us." And they'll say, see, baptism is a figure. The Bible even says it's a figure. The problem is that the text says it saves us. The figure there is a comparison. It is a type antitype. The type is the water that saved the people on the ark. The antitype is the water that saves us, the fact that we are saved by water. Friends, I would never go to 1 Peter 3.21 if I wanted to disprove baptism. In fact, listen to the last part of this verse. This is from the ESV. It says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, why is baptism described in this passage as an appeal to God for a good conscience, for a clear conscience. Why do I get a clear conscience when I'm baptized? Friends, it's because in baptism the guilt is taken away, the sin is taken away, and that's why I have a good conscience, a clear conscience. Okay, argument number eight. A final argument that sometimes people make is this. They will say that baptism is not always mentioned. Sometimes people will wonder, if baptism is necessary, why isn't it always mentioned in cases of conversion? Well, you might be surprised at the answer to this question. In the book of Acts, which is the book of conversions, there are obviously a lot of different conversion accounts. I want you to look at this chart with me. Across the top is the steps of the plan of salvation. We have preaching, which would represent hearing the gospel, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Now down the left we have the conversion accounts. I want you to notice this. The people on the day of Pentecost heard the preaching of the gospel, Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. They believed, they repented. It is not specifically stated that they confessed, but then it is recorded that they were baptized. With the people of Samaria we are told that they heard the gospel, they believed. Repentance and confession are not specifically mentioned. But baptism is mentioned. With the Ethiopian eunuch, we are told that he heard the gospel, he believed, repentance is not mentioned, confession is mentioned, baptism is mentioned. With Saul in Acts chapter 9, we are taught that Saul heard the gospel. It's implied that he believed it. It's implied that he repented. It's implied that he confessed. And, of course, he was taught to be baptized in Acts 22 and verse 16. With Cornelius... He heard the gospel. He believed it. It's implied he repented. Confession is not mentioned, but baptism is commanded. With Lydia, we have that she heard the gospel. It's implied she believed. Repentance is not mentioned. Confession is not mentioned. And she is baptized. With the jailer, in Acts chapter 16, he heard the word. He was taught. Repentance is not mentioned. Confession is not mentioned. But he was baptized according to Acts 16.33. With the Corinthians in Acts chapter 18, they heard the word, they believed it. Repentance is not mentioned. Confession is not mentioned. He was baptized. With the Ephesians in Acts chapter 19, they heard the word, they were taught. Repentance is not mentioned. Confession is not mentioned. But they were baptized. Now what is interesting is the argument is sometimes made that baptism is not always specifically mentioned. But when we look at these specific conversion accounts, what we see is baptism normally is mentioned, but some of the other steps of the plan of salvation are omitted. Of course, that doesn't mean that they did not do them. It just means that they are not recorded. We understand that all of these things are necessary. Friends, there are many more arguments that people make against baptism, but the fact is they are equally as weak. There are few things that the Bible teaches as clearly and as simply as the necessity of baptism in the plan of salvation. It is where we contact the blood of Christ. It is where our sins are forgiven. It is where I am added to the church. And it is where I finally, in obedience, obtain salvation.